Dr. K. K. Ramachandran is currently an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, Government Engineering College, Thrissur. He obtained his B.Tech Honours in Mechanical Engineering from the Calicut University, Government Engineering College, Thrissur. M.Tech in Energy Management and Ph.D. in Mechanical Engineering, Welding and Joining from the Anna University. Dr. Ramachandran has around 22 years of professional experience of which six years he served in the industry and 16 years he has been teaching. His interests include welding and joining, cladding, surface coating techniques, metal matrix composites, friction stir processing, AMMC, energy conservation and fuel cells. He has many publications to his credit in journals, international conferences and national conferences. He has received the best paper award twice in his tenure. The other responsibilities held by him include the staff in charge, the Mechanical Engineering Association and TechCube purchase in charge, group tutor UGNPG and he is a CAC committee member and anti-sexual harassment cell and he is a member of the NBA Accreditation Committee and an expert commissioner in the CDRFS Kerala. Thank you, sir. We now hand over the session to you, sir. Good morning, all of you once again. So, my topic is the development in dissimilar joining of aluminum alloys and steel. Of course, my experience in this area is, is my, as part of my PhD research, I have uh, uh, done uh, joining of dissimilar aluminum alloys and steel by using friction steel welding technique. So I think without much introduction, we straight away go to the uh, topic. Uh, so this gives an overview of my presentation. Of course, uh, uh, as an introduction, I will give you uh, the main uh, factors which makes uh, the joining of aluminum alloy and steel difficult and the associated challenges. Then uh, joining techniques, uh, different categories have given the then finally, if time permits, we will have some discussion on the corrosion characterization because once we join uh, uh, aluminum alloy and steel or dissimilar joints, we cannot avoid uh, galvanic couple formation and the associated uh, increased corrosion. So as we know, uh, some of the points, you know, we just recollect for the time being. Uh, as for aluminum alloys are concerned or aluminum is concerned, it is having very high uh, electrical and thermal conductivity, low melting point and uh, very low density and of course as for the density aspect is concerned it is having uh, uh, much significance we find its application as for automotive for uh, as uh, now we were i was speaking with uh, the person from integral coach factory so he was mentioning that they are going to manufacture aluminum coaches so weight reduction is a, an important aspect there so aluminum is having very high uh, what is called strength to weight uh, ratio so that in fact, it is an attractive option for making low weight sections or structures wherever it is having application. And another important uh, property is it readily react with oxygen and form passive oxide layer, layer at the surface. In fact, this property is good uh, as for the corrosion characteristics are concerned and uh, of course, when it comes to joining, this is an important uh, hurdle. Now, comes to the density of the oxide, it is aluminum oxide is uh, in fact a slightly higher density than aluminum, but uh, fortunately or it floats over the aluminum and sometimes this fortunate thing will become unfortunate uh, when it is floating over the uh, weld pool while you make a fusion welding of aluminum. Now, this material is a typical electronegative element in ordinary condition, it does not form continuous solid solution with any other element. So, this is a hurdle. Uh, in so we cannot make uh, as easily as uh, alloys uh, that we can make with iron using aluminium. Then of course it can have uh, you know, limited solid solution uh, with uh, lithium, magnesium, copper, zinc, uh, uh, again silicon etc. So that we can you know we know that there are uh, 8 uh, varieties you know series of aluminium alloys starting from 1000 to 8000 and in this different uh, you know, classes you know there are prime alloying elements starting from all these you know magnesium copper, zinc, etc. Now, as the most electronegative element, aluminum can form compounds, aluminates with many electropositive metals. 
and uh, we can see that it's another uh, the, the important or the the the, the, the uh, characteristics of aluminum is that it can form a different stoichiometric compound with uh, uh, very complex composition with many elements like iron we can have fe3al fe2al5 then like vanadium molybdenum rhenium many many metals you know it form com very complex uh, intermetallic compounds then as per the aluminum association we already knows this fact uh, there are some eight designation that is 1004 commercial pure aluminum 2000 series copper aluminum alloy 3000 magnesium like that uh, 5000 is magnesium uh, 6000 is magnesium and silicon so zinc and lithium is for rare earth elements now also we know that as for uh, the 1000 3000 and 5000 series are concerned they are not heat treatable uh, but strain hardenable aluminum alloys and for the 2000 6000 and 7000 series they are heat treatable and of course we know that these heat treatable alloys these properties can be improved by precipitation of secondary phases and again while we weld whether it is uh, similar similar joint while welding naturally this you know this destruction of this precipitate and uh, there is possibility for losing the qualities similarly is the case with uh, uh, the strain hardenable alloys when we uh, weld or do some processing strain based processing it loses its hardness strain hardness so that's all problems now coming to hydrogen of course the 4000 series we do have both classes i think thermally uh, treatable and uh, non treatable aluminum alloys now coming to iron, we know that it is an element mm. in group 8 in the periodic table and it is a transition metal with incomplete diesel. Again, it has different crystal modifications that we know the alpha iron, gamma iron, delta iron, etc. Now we're coming to alpha iron forms continuous solute solution with the, it's only possible the continuous continuous solute is only possible with vanadium and chromium. And for gamma iron modification will form continuous solute solution with a family of elements. And that is why we could make and again we can say that uh, this particular element lithium, sodium, etc. it cannot form. Uh, solid solution and uh, uh, because of the solubility you know aspect we can make a variety of alloys uh, carbon al uh, with the carbon and alloying elements uh, suitable for wide variety of applications now we will uh, give a comparison of the uh, properties of aluminum and uh, steel here and of course the dead market things are very important as for the similar joint is concerned we could see that the melting point of course it is for different variety of steel it is 1372 to 1510 and of course we know that for pure aluminum it is 1534 1540 as the purity is concerned and for aluminum alloy different grades it starts from 500 to 640 and pure iron maybe it may be a pure aluminum it may be around 60 degrees centigrade and again yield strength and size etc in coming to the thermal conductivity or electrical conductivity of course it is significant difference is there as per the international uh, annual copper standards it is around 60 to 65 percentage for uh, aluminum and 12% and 2.5% for stainless steel and coming to thermal conductivity you could see there is significant difference as for the steel is concerned aluminum the value is 220 to 245 for different grades of aluminum alloys but for uh, steel you see it is uh, very less compared to that and this value is given for up to 100 degrees centigrade now again coming to different aspect you come to the coefficient of thermal expansion that is very significant again you see that there is significant difference as for the value of uh, coefficient of thermal expansion is concerned that is again another uh, concern as for the uh, thermal joining of uh, dissimilar aluminium alloy and steel is concerned now aluminium alloy is joining and why do uh, where do you find the application because there are now you know we are everybody is concerned about uh, uh, fuels uh, everybody are concerned about uh, uh, the quality of the environment okay so naturally and of course uh, uh, as for the space application is concerned we can uh, we, we have we, we have to do much again now uh, as for the you know satellite launching etc is concerned if we increase the payload to increase the payload we have to reduce the weight of yesterday you know that Ramesh Narayan sir was talking if you want to increase the payload naturally we have to reduce the weight so weight reduction is an important aspect where we find application of uh, aluminium and steel together now it can be in ship building where again the payload because if you reduce the weight of shapes we can increase the payload again order of this application again payload increase and automotive structures we will get two things that uh, we can fortunately save the precious fuel fossil fuel and while saving each drop of fuel in fact we are uh, saving the environment too and of course we find in many many industries we find uh, the application of uh, uh, joining aluminium alloys and steel together and the motive of course I mentioned and now again uh, we can uh, just mention about the cooperative fuel, uh, fuel efficiency standard which is notified by uh, Bureau of Energy Efficiency in 2016. 
It in fact envisaged an increase of about 5 kilometers per liter, up to 3,000 kg vehicles in next five years. That means by 2021, we have to increase the average fuel efficiency of uh, medium or low to medium uh, vehicles uh, by 5 kilometers per liter. Now we know that as for the engine development, one aspect where we can have uh, increased efficiency is the development as for the IC engines are concerned, where we in fact have done much. Uh, integration of mechatronics, you know, maybe as for automobiles are concerned, continuously variable transmission, uh, maybe the valve mechanism, maybe the fuel admission mechanic like uh, CADRA or GDI. Such a technology, in fact, uh, we cannot say it is saturated because much scope will be there, but the increments, the chance for increase in the fuel efficiency is quite less. And uh, in 2005, it was, you know, reported that by some American survey, multi-material vehicle body design can, in fact, reduce the weight of the vehicle by about 50 percentage. There is scope for reduction. And every 10 percentage reduction in weight can have an increase in uh, fuel efficiency by around uh, 6 to 8 percentage. And this is accomplished by uh, the use of different materials together like uh, high strength steel, ultra high strength steel, maybe around 20, 20 to 20 percent reduction is possible by using thin sections. Then aluminum alloy around 50 percentage because we know that approximately around one third we have seen that density is around one third as compared to steel. Then again uh, uh, using magnesium, main magnesium alloys around 15, 10 to 15 percent possibility is there. Then these uh, polymer based composites, again, maybe 5 to 10 percentage. So by this way, we can, uh, in fact, uh, reduce the weight by up to 50 percentage. So the fuel efficiency can be improved even better than what we uh, envisaged in the uh, corporate fuel standard, uh, no, fuel efficiency standard notified by Bureau of Energy Efficiency. So this concept, so every automotive industry is, in fact, running for a solution, maybe a technology for joining aluminum alloy and steel. And in fact, if I say that, you know, the, why I have come to the, because my basically, as uh, now introducer has mentioned, my area is, uh, uh, in fact, I did my MTech in energy management. Then once I joined as a QAP scholar under Dr. Murugan, my beloved professor is very much here. So I, I, you know, I was in a you know, dilemma, what I have to do, because basically I'm a person like this and uh, where I have to end it up, whether to go to production or some other area. So fortunately, that particular day when I was uh, sitting in the library thinking about this, in fact, I don't know whether my professor knows that. I came across an uh, article in Hindu. Uh, it was mentioned in 2012, I think, uh, something like, you know, Honda has developed a new technology for joining aluminum and steel. And once I searched into the net, I understood that it is something like, because they have not disclosed the theory of the, maybe the technology uh, in Toto. So what I understood by the basic uh, principle, minimum knowledge then, was that it is based on friction steer welding. So I just moved on that. Then finally I decided to take uh, uh, this uh, you know, subject, which is joining this very, people usually you know, say that it's very complex, it's very difficult to join aluminum and alloy. Please don't take it, that will be the first advice. But uh, fortunately I could join it and I could get my PhD. So that's the motivation then come to, okay, again I've told all these things, aesthetics will be there, weight reduction will be there. So for all these aspects you need to join uh, aluminum with steel. So here it shows, you know, where this, you know, aluminium uh, can be used, where else, you know, where, where absolutely steel need to be used. And the main problem with aluminium, what I think is that it is uh, the uh, endurance limit is quite less. The cyclic loading limit, you know, and some of the aluminium alloy doesn't even process a clear limit. It will fail at different cyclic loads. So this is a, pro a limitation or a, or a critical issue where we cannot completely go for uh, aluminium or even totally we want to go to uh, aluminium completely in strategic sectors like the main frame of an automobile, you need to have uh, very uh, big structures for cross-section. That in fact, you know, uh, deviate whatever benefit you will get from, uh, you know, uh, weight reduction because if you want to go for a larger section, naturally the weight will be more even if you use aluminium. So there are certain strategic areas where you are compulsorily use steel high strength steel, in the rest of the areas where we can use what is called uh, aluminium integration. So you need to join aluminium and just steel together. Now the challenges, as I mentioned already, it's a large difference in melting point. You could see that around 500, 600, here it is uh, steel, it is around 1400. Then solidification effect as far as aluminium is concerned, cranks and what because the difference uh, in uh, the volumetric uh, in the contraction. The dissolution and maybe hydrogen uh, dissolution also. The dissolution of precipitation, uh, precipitation, precipitation of secondary basis, both will be there. 
in the, uh, what is the heat treatable alloy is the precipitate which gives strength beta precipitate etc will get completely dissolved and there may be uh, new precipitate which is arising that definitely it will create problem then extremely low mixture solubility that is a big issue because everywhere now we are facing the problem in mostly we are facing the problem as per the solubility is concerned the solubility is nearer to zero or some times we can uh, there is no such limit exact limit is being determined so naturally iron and steel comes together they uh, in fact react each other and form intermetallic compounds then large difference in thermal expansion coefficient and again thermal conductivity this will definitely constitute residual stresses warping distortion etc then the other problem is high affinity of aluminum to oxygen forming st stable aluminum oxide that is an issue aluminum oxide though it is good as per the corrosion is concerned already mentioned it is not good as per joining is concerned then high solubility of hydrogen molten alloy so it results uh, uh, porosity so this figure in fact gives the equilibrium phase diagram of iron and aluminum and we could see that you know there are you know the regions around 30 percent aluminum 30 to 40 you could see that there is uh, fe3al then again after 60 and 80 you could see there are stable aluminum iron intermetallic formations this uh, in this one it's all the combinations have not been marked only the stable one which are very frequently occurred is uh, marked here now coming to as per the equilibrium phase diagram possibility to form seven non stoichiometric intermetallics fe3al feal as per the you know as you go to the right you could see that the aluminum concentration steadily increases and finally some fe's al6 like that you know complex uh, metastable compound uh, intermetallic compounds can generate and all these aluminum because most of these you can see that this feal3 and all it's very aluminum rich and they are uh, very hard and brittle when compared to uh, iron rich uh, imcs and diffusion of aluminum to aluminum side is very fast uh, the literature says that uh, the diffusion co co rate is not constant as per uh, iron is concerned it is moving fast and uh, uh, aluminum it is moving at a shorter or maybe at a lower pace and uh, we may be in 47 this Krikendal, you know in his phd thesis i read it when i was doing phd uh, that you know this difference in mutual uh, uh, diffusion rate in fact uh, constitute uh, porosity or vacancies in the intermetallic uh, which is formed so the porosity or the these cracks etc which develops which is called which is very popularly called the Krikendal uh, porosity is due to this difference in what is called uh, the, the the diffusion rate so aluminum of course it is low pace and iron is moving first so aluminum rich imcs are usually when this you know fusion welding if you do aluminum with steel usually uh, high temperature uh, aluminum molten metal will be there and there is possibility for uh, uh, forming aluminum rich imcs usually the imc reaction takes place in three two stages and the first is initially a super saturated solid solution is formed by the mutual diffusion and then once the concentration reaches a particular value then uh, this transform to imc so there is some incubation time and if we can remove because suppose if the process is so fast or the cooling rate is so fast then this you know what transformation can be uh, restricted so this period uh, during this transformation and there is a mutual migration and uh, uh, what is called transformation into imc which is called the incubation time if we can make the cooling rate which is such that it is very fast they can uh, we can avoid the formation of imcs or at least reduce the formation of imcs now this gives a, an idea of what are the different uh, stable and unstable imcs that can be formed and the relative properties and the percentage of weight percentage of aluminum in that imc and we can see that for this uh, uh, iron rich uh, uh, the density is you see uh, 5.37 and for this aluminum rich comes to 3.95 similarly the hardness values we could see and again as for these values are concerned there are contradicting report in the literature i think mostly some uh, two three papers in fact repeated the values which are nearer to this so i have opted this so for aluminum rich we can see the iron rich we can see the hardness values hp values are 470 that for around 500 and for uh, aluminum rich it comes to uh, nearly 1000 so there is a progressive increase as for the aluminum rich uh, hardness as for the aluminum rich imcs are concerned so for this uh, not only that the strength uh, the brittleness is more not only the strength is very poor as density is very poor as for aluminum rich 
IMCs. So when there is large formation or thick formation of aluminum rich IMCs, naturally the strength of the joints will be very, very weak. Now coming to the factors which influence the formation of uh, uh, aluminum intermetallic, uh, iron intermetallics, of course there is no doubt temperature and times are important, time is, are important parameters. In addition to that, uh, pressure and deformation are also important, the strain rate is also are so important. Also it is you know what is understood from the study is that uh, alloying elements like zinc, silicon etc, magnesium etc are also playing an important role on IM uh, intermetallic reaction. As for zinc is concerned, if there is zinc, you know naturally because of which in CM decolmental transfer welding or even brazing, we used to go for a plating or zinc coating or galvanized steel, you know instead of using a plain steel, we first zinc coat the steel. Then zinc coat steel will be subject to brazing or cold metal transfer. In that case, zinc will be there as an inner layer and zinc is having high affinity towards aluminum to form eutectic solution. So naturally what happens is instead of reacting aluminum with steel or intermetallic reaction, zinc uh, with aluminum reaction will be predominantly permitted and uh, that will in fact arrest or at least retard the formation of uh, aluminum intermetallic. So uh, alloying events also uh, plays an important role. Then it is uh, further established that this pressure, pressure is very important but uh, such studies are in fact very less. Uh, I think there is, you know, we can have uh, a lot of research as for the kinetics of uh, intermetallic reaction, not with uh, fusion welding, with uh, what is called uh, uh, this, you know, friction steel welding or friction welding, where there is a lot of pressure and strain is uh, coming into play. And it's also reported that a temperature as low as 100 to 150 degrees is sufficient to cause ion diffusion. In salt shade welding, like FSW, most probably diffusion cannot be the major component of IMC formation because many papers, you know, uh, which is discussed, what I come across, uh, in fact, discussed uh, uh, this, uh, you know, this mechanism is or the IMC formation is exclusively by uh, what is called diffusion. But it is not so. It, it is a reality. It cannot be so. But and, and recently when I have uh, given a paper, I have mentioned somewhere in that, uh, you know, it is uh, a diffusion word. As if, you know, it's other, uh, other mechanism I have not mentioned. So immediately the reviewer told me that either you do produce uh, sufficient data for stating that this is by diffusion or you just re remove the word. So I was not having, because even he is telling that if somebody has published a paper uh, stating that diffusion is the major component or diffusion only is mentioned, it doesn't relay that or doesn't mean that you also mentioned that. So you, if it is, uh, it, if it is 100 percent sure, you produce data or you remove the word uh, diffusion from the discussion. So what I have done is straightforward, it is very simple because I have to get, get my paper accepted. So I removed the word diffusion from my discussion, uh, two, three places I have mentioned that. So uh, this aspect in fact it is having uh, much significance because other than the diffusion, this uh, mechanical mixing and high pressure as we find in uh, FSWs also plays an important role. And also it is established that it is another important thing but it is fortunate too, a thin layer of IMC at the joint interface can provide better joint strength or joint integrity. So uh, now everybody is, you know, because we cannot avoid, because it is having high, high affinity uh, mutually for iron and aluminum, so we cannot avoid 100% the formation of intermetallic compounds at the joint interface. So what we can do is, okay, you limit it to certain level where maybe few microns, maybe one to five micron or so, uh, that again depends on uh, the type of aluminum, it is not a constant. In our studies, uh, as for 5000 series aluminum alloy and the HSLA steel, what we have observed is that an average AMC thickness of around 1 micron is conducive. Even less than 1 micron is okay, but provided that uh, layer should be there for the entire joint thickness. You know, what happens is that unfortunately, if the thickness is less than 1 micron, towards the bottom of the joint, because we are con controlling the parameters such that the heat input is quite less. So in such a case, towards the bottom of the joint, the intermediate formation is not there. So the strength of the joint is less. So around for 5000 series, around 1 micron thickness is giving better result. For 6000, it is reported in the literature that around 5 to 10 micron, in fact, uh, can provide better joint integrity. Now coming to the joining technique and uh, uh, maybe some confusion regarding uh, some of the uh, you know, semi-fusion and uh, fusion joining technique I have categorized. So these are the different techniques that is, you know, these adhesive bonding, mechanical bonding techniques, you know, naturally now uh, automotive industries are, uh, you know, currently in use. 
adhesive bonding of course they are largely using together with in fact in the actual field condition they are using riveting or cleansing some other operation together with adhesive bonding then these you know the self rears and riveting some of the things i have shown I, will, I am going to show you then bracing laser ball rounding so for the namesake and again big welding tick welding cmt welding spot welding resin spot welding then for solid state welding techniques different techniques are uh, in fact trial and of course we cannot say that uh, uh, many of these things are co not commercial other than the bonding and mechanical bonding and adhesive bonding techniques now coming to the adhesive bonding i just told you that is long strength and sensitive temperature and vibration but still it is in use together with other operation like clinching that is shown here clinched joints are shown here diving a die and punch and you can have uh, you know sheets and all you know you can pass under the die and uh, you know the, the under the punch and you can clinch it and form the joints and the other one is self piercing riveting that is also very you can do you know automotive metal making they are using it and we could see that in automotive or cars and all we can see the back side of the rivet uh, the, the top figure the first figure and uh, as for aluminum sheets are concerned these are in fact done without drilling but as for uh, steel and aluminum is concerned we have to drill hole in the steel plate because it won't pierce otherwise and for this uh, friction steer blind riveting also you know with the rivet itself will tool as against friction steer tool the rivet itself will pierce through again as for steel and aluminum is concerned we have to drill a hole in the steel plate then we have to pierce it rotate it and then you have to have a mantle from the back to press it out and shape it and lock it resistant spot welding of course uh, uh, shown here is known to us and again as uh, melting is there at the interface so the problem here is that in imbalance in the heating because there is uh, as already mentioned uh, aluminum is low melting point lot of conduction difference conductivity difference lot of things are there and uh, so due to the similar reason or same reason expulsion and thinning of aluminum is a big problem in uh, resistant spot welding because the section will thin and the the failure is not because of the joint failure alone because of thinning load of joint if you do some tensile shear test the joint fail at the thinning portion is not exclusively because of the thinning down uh, maybe uh, imc formation but it is due to the thinning down and of course here also we cannot avoid the formation of uh, imcs at the joint interface and uh, clacking and porosity also will be there and the right figure below shows the uh, same image at the aluminum steel interface and you could see that uh, at the top nearer to the 505 to allo alloy at nearer to the alloy feal3 aluminum rich intermetallic is formed and towards bottom that means towards steel sheet you could see that it is fe2al2 which is significantly much richer as per the aluminum uh, iron concentration is concerned so towards what is called a uh, steel sheet more uh, the, uh, in the intermetallic compound form it is more rich in uh, uh, iron and towards the aluminum it is more rich in what is called uh, uh, aluminum so naturally the strength will be very poor and mostly reported less than 50% or around 50% strength only when compared to the base metal aluminum now this gives for the you know for the spot welding friction welding and other you know mechanical joining what are the how the strength varies you know it gives a comparative statement like you know when you join aluminum with this uh, uh, aluminum with iron sheet which is uh, spot welding and the last one is that al aluminum steel uh, steel joining with adhesives it gives the highest strength in fact but this is static condition not in dynamic condition also the temperature uh, is at the room temperatures not at high temperatures so considering that i think the first and last but the first one for iron iron steel only it's not for the dissimilar joint and for the last one is for the iron and uh, that means steel and uh, aluminum uh, sheet which gives in fact the the the, the, the uh, adhesive bonding is giving highest strength now coming to uh, the literature again uh, some few works maybe very few works two or three works are there which is reported because maybe uh, i didn't come across in leading international journals only very few works are reported uh, on mig welding and tick welding of aluminum steel so in all these cases you know the problem is again uh, uh, the large difference in uh, melting point is making trouble and mostly what they are doing is they are uh, melting only one component the other one is not melting very properly so sink coating of course uh, the imc formation can be recorded already we have seen that sink can act uh, in such a way that eutectic solution will be formed with the iron so that it will retard the imc reaction so in all these cases whether it is resistance welding or tick welding mig welding or the cmt we are going to discuss always it gives some favorable result when we go for coating with the sink now uh, another option is that you know some researchers have tried not only sink coating they have gone for aluminum coating 
these uh, iron sheets are coated initially with uh, uh, aluminum and they have trained but it is uh, finally resulted in very poor uh, joint strength when compared to zinc coated steel. So these are the two works which have, uh, have uh, you know, uh, come across, uh, one which you know in the MIG welding of aluminum alloy 2B50 with the stainless steel some combination and the joint in fact finally end up with uh, less than 50 percent strength and again it is an uh, lab configuration and the micro uh, this you know IMC layer thickness observed was 5 to 15 microns. And in TIG welding of aluminum A506 is another work, you know, it's again uh, uh, very complex, you know, very thick IMC formation uh, uh, is observed. It is 5 to 35 micron thickness at the interface and the strength was radically low. And this gives, of course, the schematics of the process and this left figure, of course, it shows the joint interface in SM image, BSC image. And you can see that, you know, micro fissures, uh, you know, nearly nearer to the interface in the IMC layer which makes the joint because very thick IMC layer is formed and that is make the joint very weak. Now another process you know yesterday uh, Madhusun Reddy you know Dr. Madhusun Reddy was discussing it uh, briefly and uh, in this process also again the joining process we cannot say it is uh, completely fusion welding. You can say it is an or you know or magnified uh, uh, brazing operation only because the base the steel is not getting melted. Only the aluminum portion is getting melted and again uh, it is a compulsory thing that we have to use uh, zinc coated steel. Bare steel you know somebody have tried and failed it utterly and even this you know uh, uh, what is called uh, zinc coated steel the maximum uh, strength which is achieved is something around 65 percentage. And recently you know when I two two three times when I gone to IIT Chennai they are doing some good research in this area and uh, one of the research scholar I could not uh, recollect his name. He told that he could achieve even a strength up to 70 percentage of the base aluminum alloy. And another uh, limitation of this process is that uh, we cannot uh, join it in uh, bud configuration. It is only possible in lab configuration. So that is another limitation. So mostly in engineering situation, you know, application situation, we need to join you know, in bud configuration. So that is not possible. Now coming to the process, uh, I think uh, uh, this is a thing that it is developed by uh, Mrs. Florinus, uh, Fl Florinus of Australia in the year 2004 and I think as for aluminum is concerned in many uh, welding application is in use and as for uh, aluminum steel welding, I think still you know it is not fully developed or fully in, in, in a commercial application way I think because literature report says like that. And uh, this system, what it is doing is that uh, you see the net uh, heat input is reduced by some push-pull arrangement for the uh, filler material. So I will show you one uh, uh, video. So during welding process, this road, you know, this filler material is getting uh, pushed and pulled. So during the short circuit period, it will be pushed back pulled back so the tubules will get dropped then again it will be pushed up like that this process repeats and actually the net heat input will be significantly less than that of a continuous arc and a continuous uh, unmovable electrode. I think the same thing only it will be repeating the same thing so we will go to the slide. So this is an equipment, the photograph of an equipment and the other one is an application <coughs> as for the automotive body, uh, you know, welding is concerned, a dissimilar, no, it's not dissimilar, it's a similar welding. Now this, uh, the important aspect is that the digital process control that detect a short circuit and then helps to detach the plate by retracing the wire, that's already we have seen that. And during welding, the wire moves forward and it's pulled back again as soon as the short circuit occurs. As a result, the arc can reduce heat only for a very brief period during which the arc burning phase. And the short circuit is controlled and the current is kept low resulting in a pattern free material transfer. The arc length is detected and adjusted mechanically and the arc remains stable 
irrespective of the natural work piece, surface or how fast the user welds. So these are in fact the main characteristics of uh, such a welding. And coming to this, you know, it is in fact, uh, uh, it has got a heart of the system as a wire feed system, which can push and pull. And the other one is the brain of the system, which is the high speed digital control. So when these two work tandem, we will get uh, low temperature fusion welding very effectively. Now coming to the dissimilar uh, uh, aluminum steel joining in steel depresses, the molten aluminum part gets braced to the steel base plate by an intermediate zinc layer in lab configuration only. So we cannot use it in other configuration or at least not try it. The zinc layer is originating from the galvanized steel process. So, so this is a pre-requirement that we have to use steel which is plated originally or initially by zinc. The zinc layer increases the wettability of iron on steel and retards the aluminum Fe IMC reaction by increasing the incubation time, in effect. So filler wire usually is an aluminum alloy with a certain amount of silicon. So it is commercially uh, available or we are to make it specially for a particular alloy. The shielding gas used is argon and no flux is used in this process. So in this process also, IMC reaction between iron and aluminum cannot be avoided. And what we can do is that, or what we have to do is that we have to restrict uh, the formation of IMC to the minimum so that we can have higher joint strength. And the joint efficiency depends on the thickness of IMC layer formed at the joint interface. So uh, again, uh, as per the discussion that I had with the, uh, the, you know, the student which is, doing P which is doing PhD at IIT Madras, he is also confronting the same problem where he could, could not control the thickness of IMC layer formation. Now this uh, slide shows in fact uh, uh, a typical uh, welded you know, uh, joint where you can see that the last one is an optimized parameter combination where you have uh, uh, wonderful bead formation. But in other case also bead formations are there but it is too bigger and all. Uh, so this is the work which is reported by Kaiwot in 2013. Now coming to the same work, uh, we, we can see that the, the, board, the top one gives uh, the bead formation and different uh, uh, nomenclature and all. Uh, coming to the top one, we can see that some BSC image of the joint interface but you could see that there is at the interface there is intermetallic layer formation and there are even micro fissures and uh, again one more thing is that not much uh, what is called sink is there at the interlayer what happened is that the interlayer completely in fact melted off at or eutectic solution is formed and it is moved to the sides while aluminum is getting bonded to the steel surface and uh, we could see only you know that the iron and uh, silicon and aluminum only are there and also in the belt bit because the belt metal is there at the right side where you can see some precipitate also. Now this is another work is saying it reported in 2009 and again you could see that uh, very thick uh, intermetallic layer formation at the uh, interface maybe you know around of 10 microns. For 6000 fortunately this I think it is 6000. Uh, aluminum alloy and that is why he got, he is mentioned that around 60 percentage is joint strength or 70 percent, up to 70 percent joints so he has reported. Uh, maybe because it is uh, uh, 6000 series aluminum alloy and if it is 5000 series and even if it is 3 micron thickness, uh, the strength will be drastically low. And the other upper figure also you can see that there are micro fissures in the intermetallic layer which makes the joint uh, uh, in fact uh, uh, very weak. Uh, this is the same order, of course, this is first 2008 paper and the other words, in fact, it is 2009. That is again, here it is a P2L, what is aluminum, pure aluminum with a hot dip galvanized uh, iron sheet uh, where he has got, uh, I think, around 40 or 50 percent strength. And again, the aluminum, what is called aluminum intermetallic formation is a P2L5 and a P2L3. That means it is all aluminum rich intermetallic formations. This is another work which is reported by, I think it is by Jian uh, uh, Yu et al in 2013. Again, the strength is around 60, 65 percentage only. We could see that again, intermetal formation is there. But of course, uh, here now it is maybe around 5 micron average thickness only. So that is again, uh, the strength, uh, not much difference uh, around uh, maybe uh, 60 percentage, I think if memory is correct. And this particular, uh, you know, author, in fact, Ibo et al. 2015, uh, they have tried something different. Along with the uh, CMT, they used some uh, axial uh, EMF application. In fact, the paper, you know, after reading, I could not understand what exactly how they have done it, how they have applied this EMF exactly. They are telling that the axis of welding, they have applied certain uh, EMF also. 
and uh, I think Lorentz force, you know, when uh, there is some charged particle is moving and uh, with there is a potential EMF, EMF is applied, naturally there is a Lorentz force which will rotate the particles uh, in a rotary path. So, he, they are telling that this rotary movement of the, uh, you know, uh, charged particle, that means electrons, is making uh, the intermetallic uh, reaction slower. So, they have not explained how exactly this being happened and that is why unfortunately I could not uh, say that. But anyway, they have reported that when we use an axial uh, EMF along with, you know, in CMT, the joint strength is improved by around 10 to 15 percentage. So, somebody can do such, you go through this particular paper, uh, do understand, read very well, understand and do some research in that area, we can produce some result. So, by this I stop uh, <laughs> the CMT technique and let us go to the laser bracing. Or again, uh, it is all same only because all these operations are you know, almost nearer to bracing and here in bracing it is exactly bracing. But instead of uh, using some uh, you know, uh, zinc or something like that, we use here actually aluminum alloy, a low temperature aluminum alloy as uh, the, the filler metal for the bracing. And uh, the different, uh, you know, different uh, research, uh, no, researchers have used a different uh, level of power input and the bracing speed is also different and filler feeding rate is also different. It's in ultimately 3 to 6 kilowatt they have used power. Bracing speed is 1 to 3 meters per minute and filler feeding rate is 3 to 6 meters per minute. Different uh, authors in fact. And uh, commercially and usually, uh, you know, commercially available uh, aluminum filler wires like Sholex, Nicolex and etc. The fluoride is used as FEX which is already mixed in the uh, filler material. So, this shows in fact a work uh, uh, reported by, I missed the order I think. Okay, this again it is two, uh, GA uh, steel, uh, galvanized steel and uh, aluminum alloy, then uh, cold rolled steel and aluminum alloy, two works they have reported and in that case you can see that around 18 percentage plus code wire, at, they got the highest because they have used different uh, speeds. So, at a particular speed at 18 percentage FCW, they got the highest strength. And again, uh, for the second also, CR steel and aluminum alloy, same 18 percent FCW fresh code wire and uh, the same 5 kilo, uh, maybe I think it is 3 uh, meters per minute, they got the highest strength. And again, coming to the, uh, the, the micrographs, we can see that at the interface, they have mentioned uh, some HV627. In both the diagrams, you can see without flux and with flux, they have done it. And we could see that HV627 and here it is HV686. So, it is uh, clear that there is intermetallic formation, but they have not gone for any EDS analysis or something, but this Ernest clearly indicates that it is not steel and it is not uh, uh, aluminum also. So, it is some intermetallic formation is there that you cannot avoid. And of course, in uh, bracing also, the formation of intermetallic should be controlled for getting the sufficient uh, joint strength. So, I mean, we will come to the solid state uh, process uh, friction steel spot welding. As we know, because uh, in friction steel, these are the different variables. Stroll rotation speed is important, axial force is important. All time, as for uh, friction steel spot welding is concerned, is it, uh, unlike uh, uh, friction steel welding, all time is very important. Plunge depth is uh, very important as for this you know, particular iron, aluminum and steel is concerned. Then stool shoulder diameter, because the tool shoulder diameter, tool rotation speed, axial force, together determine and shoulder diameter of course it determine what should be the heat generated. So, heat generation is important. In addition to that the plunge depth because we know that in aluminum, aluminum is characterized by low uh, flow stress. So, the heat generation in FSW process whether it is spot welding or uh, uh, spot welding or friction steel welding or even friction steel processing. It is by two mechanisms. One is the uh, friction, of course, internal friction as well as the external friction. The other one is uh, uh, the deformation. So, the heat generation from the material deformation is a function of the flow stress. Now, if the flow stress is very less, naturally, for aluminum material, the flow stress is quite less. Naturally, the heat generation due to material deformation will be significantly less. The major component or even if you can assume that the heat generation due to material deformation is zero in aluminum, nothing uh, is going to happen as per the final result is concerned. But in the case of steel or such a very, you know, uh, high flow strength material, the significant, that means the component of heat by flow or the deformation is very significant. Now, what happens is that when the plunge depth is very high, that means the plunge depth towards the steel side because always, you know, while doing this uh, 
uh, operation of spot welding, aluminum sheet will be placed at the top in laminar combination and the steel should be at the bottom. Now, the penetration of the pin to steel is the plunge depth, not the total plunge. The penetration of the steel pin, uh, pin into the steel plate is the plunge depth. Now, in some of the work, what they have done is that they made it zero. That means they just uh, slide over the uh, iron sheet or steel sheet. Even in that case, because of the heat and the time, there will be diffusion of aluminum and there will be some minor intermetallic layer formation. And in some work, you know, they have tried up to 0.2 millimeter, up to 0.2 millimeter depth where they got some good strength. Beyond 0.2 millimeter depth, none of the reports, you know, none of the you know, research have reported some good strength. So the thing is that when you uh, plunge more into the steel, the heat, localized heat generation due to uh, what is called uh, the, the flow stress, that means the deformation will be significantly high. This cause high rate of intermetallic reaction and very thick what is called intermetallic layer at the joint interface. When the thickness of intermetallic, as already mentioned, when the thickness is more, naturally the strength will be less. So that is what is happening. So this plunge depth is a very important. And also in some of the research, what they have done is, they have gone for zero depth. That means there is zero plunge towards the steel. Then what they have done is, they have gone for annealing it or aging treatment, maybe keeping at around 300 degrees centigrade or 120 degrees or 200 degrees centigrade, keep it for half an hour, one hour like that. So there will be diffusion and intermetallic reaction. So the interlayer will be formed and that we can control so that the strength can be enhanced. So these are the different works which, which has been reported in the uh, literature. So again, it is already mentioned that then uh, it is already implemented in automotive. Some of the automotive companies have already started doing this. And these are in fact that figures some some you know, well the nomenclature as for the SP, you know, uh, FSSP is concerned. We can see that the shoulder diameter of the tool, the pin diameter of the tool, SP is a uh, shoulder plunge, TP is a tool plunge, steer zone says uh, EST is effective uh, sheet thickness, ST is a sheet thickness, hook, some hook like formation will be there exit hole, then HH that is hook height, then there will be FBR that is fully bonded region, we can see that, that portion only fully bonded, then there is partially bonded PBR, then there will be unbonded region on either side. So, uh, these are the normal cases that we see, and there is some flash formation that also we cannot avoid. Once you have, you know, you cannot have uh, uh, flash free because once the tool is getting, shoulder is getting plunged, flash will be definitely be formed. And again, if there is plunge of the pin towards the steel side, naturally there will be some hoof formation too. So, this we cannot avoid. Now, this is a particular work and the report, and here is telling that uh, uh, 6 kilo has has applied different times. Holding time has increased 1 second, uh, 2 second, uh, 3 second, 4 second, like that. And he has again varied uh, what is called different uh, tool rotation speed. So in such cases, what he has got is uh, he got a better strength at 3000 RPM and a four second hold time. And again, uh, even you know these uh, joints, if you keep for long, as uh, morning Dr. Professor uh, uh, Sadish was was mentioned, uh, we may get you know sometimes you know if time progresses. This intermetallic layer can grow because again uh, recently what I have done is some of the work pieces which have made welded some three years back have gone for some characterization. So as you see uh, it is all changed. There is minor difference in the thickness of intermetallic form. That means even at room temperature I think the intermetallic uh, layer is growing. I don't know how it has happened. Because the species, in fact, have uh, tested it at several because uh, a large number of you know uh, some image if you have taken. And now recently when I have gone for it and the, the thickness is uh, you know, marginally uh, increased. So whether something is happening at room temperature maybe or maybe uh, I kept these pieces you know at the terrace. Maybe that temperature around 50 degrees again causing because it's something you know to be investigated. I don't know what is happening. Because the literature says that 100 to 150 degrees centigrade is sufficient for iron uh, you know, diffusion and intermetallic growth. Now uh, I don't know whether 50 degrees centigrade is also sufficient. We have to do some research. Okay, these are the things there. Then coming to the friction steer welding, of course, uh, my, you know, my PhD work. So these are the different parameters that need to be looked into while we are doing FSW of uh, aluminum and steel. Of course, as usual, tool rotation speed is there, tool travel speed, that is the welding speed. Axial force is very important. Tool tilt angle is important. Tool material, of course, it is important because if you use some uh, case fortified like tool steel, it will not time, you know, it will get dissolved into the uh, weld. So tool axis offset is a very important aspect because in uh, aluminum welding what we do is that 
we will uh, keep the axis in line with the joint interface. Two axis will be in line with the joint interface and uh, morning, uh, you know, Sadish uh, sir was telling that keeping the tool uh, axis in line with the well and then a joint interface is not good. We have to have some offset towards the right. Advancing side, he's telling like that because a lot of study, you know, still we have to make a lot of uh, you know, studies in this area and uh, do the, if you want to convert the process into commercial level, I think more clinical trials are required. So, uh, this is an aspect. So, in this case, it is very important, very sensitive that we have to mostly stir uh, the, 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 the joint through aluminum and very little bit into the steel. That is very important. This is the same as for copper and aluminum, magnesium and aluminum also. We have to have a tool axis offset towards the softer material. The thing is very simple. If it is, you know, if you are moving, it is uh, more largely through, the, uh, through the, the steel plate. What happens is that I told you that the steel, the flow stress is significantly high. So, the heat generated due to deformation will be very high at the local level. So, that will cause melting, even melting of aluminum alloy and significant amount of intermetallic reaction will be there that the joint cannot give any meaningful joint strength. All right. So, this is very important and then comes to the relative position of aluminum and steel that is also important and it is you know intensive study, maybe some three or four studies were reported in the literature that aluminum should be placed at the, uh, at the retreating side and steel should be at the advancing side for getting some meaningful strength. Uh, in our study, of course, I did some few trials and I got uh, utterly, uh, it been very, very, very bad results. Then the another uh, important thing is that the condition of aborting edges, particularly with, with regard to steel, the aborting edges, you know, if you simply cut shear cut and use that uh, steel, uh, naturally, you know, you won't get a joint. The thing is that I have told you that uh, the offset towards uh, uh, the penetration of the pin into steel is very significant. If there is more penetration, naturally the intermediate reaction will be accelerated. So, even some protrusion, maybe some irregularity or roughness at the surface of the joint interface will create this problem because maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5 millimeter difference will be there on the surface. This is sufficient enough to form more localized heat generation and uh, intermetallics at the joint interface. So, the condition of the aborting edges is also very important to get a successful joint as for dissimilar aluminum alloy and steel is concerned. Then another aspect that I found is because initially when I was welding, we were not getting good joints at all. The thing is that what I did was initially, as for aluminum, I made maybe 10% and less the pin length. Maybe if the thickness is 3 mm, I put 2.8 mm like that. So, what is happening is because we are using a significantly higher value of uh, axial force because the axial force usually is not like because aluminum mostly what we do is that as morning I was asking the question, the thing is that mostly we will arrest the z-axis movement. So, we does not have any control what force is applying sometimes no force will be there. Sometimes you know because of the lifting action or so if the uh, material uh, harden up or the tool lifted up. Maybe after some time, you know, it will come down because this type of action may be there sometimes, maybe in the minute level, not in a big level, maybe some wavy action like that. But in steel welding, if you want to get a good joint, we have to have a good axial force to be applied. And once we are applying axial force, though there is no deformation significantly for the steel, it will elastically deform. And because of the elastic deformation, what happens is that if you give only 2.2 millimeter difference in pin length and thickness of the plate, this pin will get hit at the, the pin will hit at the back, back plate. When the pin hit at the back plate or almost touch at the back, there will be pressure, significant pressure will be there that create a lot of heat there. So, what happens is that sometimes aluminum will melt and you won't get a good joint. So, the pin length is another important aspect to be controlled and what values require that means that I think it is a function of the thickness. If the thickness is quite more, you can have uh, maybe percentage you cannot see. If the thickness is more and more, naturally you need more more force, axial force. When more axial force is there, more elastic deformation will be there. You should only use less pin length, that way. Then again, the material and surface pin is to backup plate. Initially, we were not getting any weld because once we weld him, because Sashi, was, Sashi and myself was doing the welding. Sashi is there in the audience. So, uh, after welding, you know what, you know, simply if you tilt it, it will break. Like, papadam. It's no way out. So, this process in fact uh, the very important finally what I understood that the surface finish of the backup plate is also important because if the surface is having unevenness, the same thing happens 
the tool you know intermittently will come in heat or maybe very nearer high pressure will be there naturally heat generation will be high there so you won't get a good joint so i think uh, these aspect are not uh, studied and reported also because the pin length aspect i didn't see any papers which is reported again the material and surface minerals to backup plate also been recorded i think the trial and error people will do some well and report it so this aspect we can study again the kinetics of intermetallic formation that also i think a lot of study scope is there and uh, this gives that fact uh, our study uh, we have given some 0.5 because we used uh, finally uh, two things we have used initially we were not getting a good joint so we have initially gone for uh, selecting a pin so we have uh, tried with the different uh, pin geometry and also we have tried with the uh, different uh, offset and again you know uh, as i was doing this uh, research i came across a paper authored by uh, sadish vasu kailas and uh, kumar that axial you know starting from the complete aluminium going towards the right different uh, offset tool pos relative position so uh, i was search because i didn't get the paper because i have seen that it, it is there uh, in the abstract i am getting so immediately i mailed sir has sent me a collection of papers i don't know whether he uh, you sent me the papers i don't know whether you remember or not <laughs> it was happened so uh, in fact uh, the same you uh, know the, the study i have uh, in fact uh, i have used in all my uh, publication also they are reference so finally uh, what we did is you know, instead of doing the discrete values we started from aluminium completely then we welded towards as uh, the welding progresses we comes to steel up to 1 mm penetration of the tool pin and we have extracted the tensile specimen at uh, fission intervals and we have tested it and finally we arrived that for a particular spin of this configuration that is 4 mm tip diameter 5 mm root diameter that means 0.5 mm difference only has given the best result at a tool axis offset of this much tool axis offset of 0.5 mm that means there is 0.5 mm penetration at the top and zero penetration at the bottom so this has given us and all further works we have done using this pin and later on i think many have done uh, and reported uh, work on this and they to got uh, uh, a good result they have done this, this is a result for that particular pin we started completely from aluminium that means uh, that means uh, zero offset then we have moved around 0.5 mm that is two that two axis offset to 2 mm we gave uh, 188 mega pascal that is around 90 uh, 91 percentage of uh, the tensile uh, strength of aluminium then further increase that is the 124 will be around 0.9 uh, the on the right side we could see that when increase the penetration there is drastic increase uh, uh, decrease in the tensile strength and after 1 mm what is happening is it is coming to zero but again it will break like anything so uh, this is very important so unless otherwise we control the penetration of tool pin into the steel side we won't get a uh, good joint so that is very important and for the good joint 180 mega pascal how do, uh, does this you know interface looks like we could see that uh, that one is the uh, the first one aluminum alloy that is magnified the less magnified one so the three position top middle and bottom we have uh, uh, taken the uh, semi majors we could see that at the middle position the thickness is almost like 0.75 more micron like that and towards bottom it is 24 very very thin so there is throughout the joint interface uh, uh, intermetallic formation is there but it is very thin and for the uh, uh, low strength 124 you know uh, the thickness of intermetallic was something around 25 microns it's too thick and beyond that it is too thick and coming to the other side that means the penetration is not there 155 zero penetration the intermetallic was partial only towards the top region of the joint intermetallic formation was there and towards the bottom maybe half of the joint no intermetallic formation was there so it is concluded as in other research a thin layer of intermetallic layer throughout the joint interface is essential for good joint strength now these are some other welds we made by varying uh, the uh, rpm this is particular case is rpm we have varied uh, these uh, what is called welding speed axial force tool tilt etc and why i am showing this is that's a very important another important aspect in uh, uh, aluminum steel uh, welding is that the welding window is very narrow unlike uh, aluminum aluminum or aluminum dissimilar fsw we could have you know a big welding window maybe 500 to 1500 rpm we may get a good joint maybe at least a def defect free joint not the best strength joint 
But in this case, you know, I, I have tried different, maybe near 1000, I have tried near uh, 300, I have tried near 1500, different trials were there. So finally what I understood is around 500, we are getting some good strength. And uh, you could see that from 400 to 600 RPM only we could get a defect free joint. Below 500, below the 400 what was happening is uh, the tunnel like formation was there at the surface, low heat input case. And beyond 600 because of the increased heat wound boot, the joint was getting broken. Similar is the case with the uh, welding speed, maybe around 25 mm per minute only we could get good joint. Axial force of course some 3 to 4 uh, kilo newton will get it and tool tit angle also maybe, uh, tool tit angle is not that sensitive, maybe some 0.5 uh, starting 1 to 1 1.5 or 2 um, uh, degrees we were getting good joints. So interface is there and how does the uh, joint look like, that's all given there. And this is for the good joint, uh, we could see that good, uh, no, for all the joints, we could see that for the best joint, the middle one, around 1 micron thickness. And also the right side of this EBSD uh, diagrams, we could uh, see that the joint integrity, you know, there is no defect, it is fine, at the aluminum side, you could see that fine microstructure, dynamic crystallization is there and for the steel side, uh, nothing is there and also there is no diffusion into the slit side. Okay, only the intermetallic layer formation are at the boundary or towards the steel uh, aluminum side. And this uh, bottom one, uh, same image it is for the worst joint at 600 RPM, we could see that the thickness is very high. And also micro fissures are there, so the joint break easily. Now this is for the particular case where how does the tensile strength uh, varies and uh, shows the, uh, the tensile specimens. And, uh, you know, it's all the cases, it is almost, you know, we can say that it is a brittle fracture only. And in one case that the high strength joint, there is a bit of elongation is there. It's not, no necking. There is no uh, meaningful necking, but it is not. The failure is not at the joint interface. It is in the steel zone of aluminum side. So, uh, this definitely means that the joint is stronger than at least the steel zone. Okay. Now come to the variation. Because again, I told you that it is only, uh, this, this particular one is uh, for the axial force. We have started from 5 to 9, we could see that 7 axial, uh, 7 we got the highest joint strength which is around 94 percentage of the uh, tensile strength of the aluminum alloy. So these are the conclusion, uh, CMC, uh, in all, inevitably in all our uh, studies we have observed aluminum, iron, intermetallic uh, uh, and we have uh, done uh, XRD, EDS and all and uh, FEAL was there, FE2AL5 was there. FEAL3 was there. These are the important uh, one we have observed. And again, one more thing is the things that the role of silicon, etc. Because silicon is also there. Because again, this phase diagram, etc. is not very clear. I can mention some uh, silicon also there. But I am not sure whether it is an equilibrium or not. So, what I have done is, I have taken the nearest uh, stable iron aluminum intermetallic. That was the thing what I have followed. So, I think this may be a complex component, uh, compound of iron, aluminum and silicon. Maybe traces of silicon was also there. Then highest joint that I have already mentioned that is 94 percent utilities of aluminum alloy. And these are the cases again high low heat input, high heat input and uh, moderate heat input. These are the things in low heat input partial IMC layer formation. At a very high heat input, very thick IMC layer formation at the interface. So low, both the cases we have got low uh, strength. But moderate maybe around 1 micron thickness average, we got good uh, joint strength. Now this gives, uh, as for the butt joints are concerned, uh, the different uh, you know, researchers reported what is the joint strength and the highest joints are reported by different researchers so far. And the last work is ours, uh, that is uh, we got 94%, 85, 86 uh, like that. And mostly the reporter works I see in that they have uh, uh, not fixed the welding window because some you know they have arbitrarily maybe 500, 800, 1000, 1500 like that, 1500 they got zero likewise. So only some particular point only they got some meaningful uh, uh, value of uh, uh, strength, other cases they got drastically low values of uh, uh, tensile in all the cases. But in our case what we did is we identified the welding window and we have uh, uh, moved or increased the uh, welding parameters in narrow steps. Now other than but joint we can also use uh, uh, friction strip lab joints. And in this case, uh, this particular paper is something different. So this is the mechanism, only thing it's a lab point. Uh, uh, as we have seen in uh, uh, spot welding, aluminum steel will be 
aluminum plates will be located at the top and the steel will be at the bottom and the steel pin should have a certain amount of penetration and uh, there are different research which are reported in literature that zero penetration, 0.1 penetration, 0.2 penetration like that but mostly good strength, comparatively better strength is reported for around 0.1 millimeter penetration into the steel sheet. And this particular work is reported by Moh Mohavedi in 2013, what he has done is that he put again the penetration zero and he did some what is called aging treatment, annealing treatment keeping the temperature around 300 degrees centigrade and keep it for one hour. So, some intermanalic layer formation was there at the interface. Initially, the intermanalic formation was not there. So, later after the aging treatment, aging treatment, intermanalic layer was there and the strength was increased uh, to maybe around 70 percentage. Now, this is another one, uh, uh, first reported in 2016. This one, uh, they have named it like self riveting friction steel lab welding and it is published, I think, materials letters. And uh, recently, I have, uh, last month, I have reviewed a paper, the second paper on the same topic by the same authors. others. And uh, I am not going, because the paper is in the process, I, I am not going to discuss what they have done it. But again, in the reported paper, what has happened is, they have drilled, uh, in the lab configuration only, they have drilled number of holes, you know, at the maybe the spacing of 5, 8 mm, 8 to 10 mm, small holes. And as usual in uh, lap welding, friction steel lap welding, they have traversed the tool over the aluminum sheet. So, not only the bonding at the interface, the aluminum is extruded through the holes. So, there is mechanical bonding too. In addition to the surface bonding, there will be mechanical bonding too. And they are telling that the strength is increased by around 20 percentage. Now, in this case, whether I don't know whether it can be called riveting because it is all through holes, you know, simply it is protruding and piercing only. I think we can make it some conical hole, you know. So, it will be locking. We can make it like that, conical. The holes can be a little bit of conicity, so naturally it will be some locking also will be there or you can even have a step there. If there is sufficient material and pressure, naturally it can come in. But of course, the problem of thinning down because there may be a, there is around 0 0.8 to 1 millimeter thinning down because of this material which is being extruded into the holes. So, that aspect has to be looked into. So, I think uh, some scope is there for doing uh, work in this because not much work is already uh, not been done. Only second work, I think it is being reported now. So, I think it's uh, coming to uh, maybe uh, some more techniques are there. Like uh, these are all trials, maybe one paper like that. Think with FSW, somebody have tried and uh, uh, the better result they are telling that it is having some good result than FSW alone. Then laser ball bonding, in this case what they are doing is that the interface of aluminum and steel sheet because uh, lap point configuration only, they are heating it to around 400, 500 degrees centigrade and in one trial they have even uh, melted the aluminum alloy. Then afterwards what they have done is that they have uh, applied high pressure rolling. So, the intermetallic reaction was there and uh, what happened was that they could not control the intermetallic layer because in some area very high thickness intermetallic formation was there and some other area intermetallic was below. So, ultimately the average strength was around 40 percent, what they 40 to 50 percent only. Then bracing with resistant spot welding, then TIG with the laser welding, IIMC formation, then FSW with the bracing. So, these are the different techniques. Otherwise, one or two papers in fact I have seen because maybe uh, whether I do not know whether I have come across all the literature. So, by this I think uh, I will stop as for the different techniques available for joining aluminum alloys and steel. And before going to the uh, corrosion discussion, because that part is also when dissimilar metals are joined, corrosion is very important. So, before going to the discussion, we will have some, dis uh, I think, uh, so far what is covered, we will have some interaction if somebody is interested. Please. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. No, it is galvanized and annealed, that is all. The steel is annealed after galvanizing, that is all it is. So, they are telling that uh, they do have uh, uh, a little bit of difference. That means some uh, minor uh, improvement in the strength. Anyway, in both the cases, I think zinc is the uh, signifying element, you know, significant element, which is contributing as per the joining of aluminum and steel is concerned. And whether this annealing contributed or that, uh, we, have to, we have to think it, because uh, uh, no information is available how it is contributed. But they are simply saying that because this work is not uh, reported by me, you know, 
So the researchers, what they have reported is that they got better strength, marginally better strength with an yield one, Galvan yield one. And the reason is not, as usual, in many papers, it's not disclosed. Something else? Okay, now uh, we will move on to uh, uh, corrosion uh, uh, characterization. So I think this part and all uh, not required because it is general corrosion uh, aspect. Uh, you may go through it sometime if you want. The corrosion is the deterioration of distortion of metal and allow in the presence of an environment species by chemical or electrochemical uh, action in general. And as per some definition by IUPAC, the corrosion is irre irreversible interpersonal reaction of a material with its environment which results in the consumption or dilution of the material of a component of the environment. Okay. So, mostly, but, but mostly this, you know, it will result in deteriorating the uh, quality of the metal. And again, the, the, the extent of damage, you know, uh, again, somebody in 2010, it is reported that every year around 120, 150 million tons of steel is getting destroyed uh, due to corrosion. So, it is very significant and somebody it is said that it is equal to the world's, what is called the food, uh, you know, worldwide. It is equal to distribute food worldwide, the cost equivalent. So, it is very significant as for the corrosion distortion is concerned and in our discussion of course, we are more interested because it is uh, aluminum and steel in the galvanic series. It is uh, not much away, but it is significantly away from each other and naturally galvanic cells will be formed and galvanic corrosion will be the end results. So, how does it perform? So, these are the different because last day also it was you know, uh, stress corrosion crashing control that day was discussing. The other things you know, uh, I think I will be giving this uh, presentation, somebody can go through it if interested. So, coming to the galvanic corrosion, we know that uh, simply in aluminum plates, if you put a uh, steel screw for joining, you could see that the aluminum around uh, the steel screw, you know, get deteriorated, corroded. We know that most of the aluminum alloys, in general aluminum alloys are superior as per corrosion is concerned when compared to steel. I am not talking about stainless steels, other steels, low carbon steels or uh, uh, medium carbon steels are concerned. So, but when it comes in combination, we know that uh, aluminum is uh, more reactive, you know, electronegative and once it comes in combination, what happens is that aluminum, the more reactive metal will act as anode and the less reactive metal will act as cathode and naturally aluminum will be getting destructed. So, in combination though aluminum is inherently or independently very corrosion resistant, in combination aluminum will corrode or aluminum will sacrifice and iron will be getting protected. So, this is the action, this is what is happening in that. And uh, galvanic corrosion of course, and it can happen in aluminum alloys when there is, uh, you know, copper containing precipitate in aluminum alloys, locally also it can happen and impurities such as copper and iron in metallic zinc, it can also because localized cells can be, galvanic cells can be formed and uh, localized galvanic corrosion can also be there in some particular metals. So, this uh, we will skip. So, coming to the electrochemistry, simply we can understand, you know, by this uh, zinc destruction, the relation is you can see that zinc, zinc plus 2 HCl, hydrochloric acid environment, corrodion environment and zinc chloride will be formed as due to the destruction of zinc and hydrogen will be eliminated, uh, you know, resulted, produced. And the anodic and cathodic reaction sodium will be getting certain 2 plus ions and in the process it will liberate 2 electrons. And this uh, further this hydrogen which is there which will uh, react with the uh, uh, combine with the two electrons from water and the overall reaction is certain plus 2 HCl gives certain Cl2 plus H2. So, this is a distortion mechanism which is being taking place in uh, uh, galvanic uh, corrosion. And uh, these are in fact uh, the catalyst for this reaction environmental effects such as presence of oxygen and other oxidizers and change in flow rates of, uh, can be there velocity. Change in uh, temperature, concentration of pH value of reactants would influence the rate of cathodic and cathodic uh, reactions. Now, comes to the measurement of corrosion, I think uh, most of us may not be that per uh, you know, perfect in these areas uh, because uh, there are in general three uh, different methods for the measurement of corrosion. One is straightforward and it is most accurate, one is uh, the mass loss technique and if you go for not the simulated one, if you go for real time, I repeat mean real medium, long term mass loss technique, it will be the most accurate. So, what we have to do is that we put the specimen or put the component in actual environment maybe for years and usually this bot uh, metal society and all or this you know marine the sector there are a lot of agencies. What they do is that 
after welding or the fabrication of the component, they put it in actual environment, seawater, because it is the most corrosive medium. Then what happens is that they keep it for 10 years like that, 5 years like that, for these, you know, 5052, aluminum, 6083 and all these, you know, we get the data after 5 year test, 5, 10 year test, 15 year test like that. So what is the amount of destruction? So what you do, initially you weigh it and after destruction, maybe after 10 years or 5 years, again you take the mass, take the difference that is the total destruction due to corrosion. Then we can convert it into the, uh, the value which is usually we mentioned in ISI, SI system is mm per year and the old unit may be in FPS system is miles per year. It is 10 raised to minus 3 inches. So the con it, is, it is straightforward. Only it is, uh, it is not del, it is not uh, del, it is delta only. That word, uh, letter is del, delta, that is density. That is the total mass loss. Whatever mass loss is there, that is a constant for the energy, this, you know, unit conversion then density into area multiplied by the time which is taken in hours. So it is given to the words. So we can compute what or calculate what is the rate of corrosion in millimeters per year from the mass loss over a period of time. And this is the most accurate. And there are uh, simulation tests. Maybe, you know, you are splashing or artificially you are splashing, you know, sodium chloride solution, but maybe the concentration you can change. Such type of uh, simulated test also can be done in mass loss method. Then the second one third, maybe you can use, one can use this in real time, maybe in online measurement, etc. Where, you know, the, when, when, when a component, because it's based on the uh, Ohm's law, uh, it is functioning. So we know that uh, R is equal to rho into the resistivity multiplied by length divided by area. And for a given element, suppose if you have a component, okay, for a given length, uh, the, uh, we can assume that the resistivity constant, so area changes. What happens over a period of time when corrosion happens, the area comes down. So when there is area reduction, there will be increase in uh, resistance. So what you can do is that this particular coupon or element, you can put part of a uh, Wheatstone bridge. So naturally the imbalance will be calibrated in terms of the mass loss. Simply you can apply the formula. So finally, directly on the display, you will get the corrosion rate in mm per year or whatever value we want. So this can be used for the online, uh, maybe real time measurement of corrosion also. Now, electrochemical method that is most frequently nowadays, you know, researchers are using, uh, whether, uh, you know, uh, maybe it is a type of extrapolation or linear polarization uh, resistance or linear polarization, uh, polarization resistance or linear polarization resistance, LPR, which is predominantly called. These two techniques are in fact most commonly used by researchers, at least for the sake of getting a paper published. Now, practically, uh, you know, uh, two uh, approaches are there. Either we can use the control potential, or potential static, or control current, galvanostatic polarization technique for both this technique. But usually, again, you know, as uh, uh, it is granted, we mostly go for potential static, change the, vol uh, the voltage, potential static measurements. Other methods such as open circuit potential decay, AC impedance measurement, electrochemical noise measurement are also there for the uh, accurate quantification of corrosion. And of course, we know one other technique which is based on the electrochemical uh, polarization only. It is cyclic polarization technique. It is a method used to find the pitting corrosion tendency of specimen in a corrosive medium. Now, uh, first we will discuss uh, the Teifel uh, extrapolation uh, method. In this one, what we do is that we will polarize the specimen for about uh, plus or minus uh, 300 millivolt on either side of the corrosion potential. And for an electrochemical reaction under activation control, this is important. Uh, if this method to be used, very strictly speaking, the reaction or the electrochemical reaction must be under activation control. But uh, predominantly in most of the cases, you know, what happens is that uh, we will apply for all the cases where it is concentration control or concentration limited or passivated. In all those cases also, we invariably use this and also literature, you know, uh, publishing, you know, reviewers and all, maybe knowingly or unknowingly, they will accept it. But very strictly speaking, uh, if you want to apply, if one want to apply this uh, reactions either uh, side, that means cathode or anode side, must be activation controlled. Then uh, the figure is there in the next page. This is a very, very common figure. But now this axis are all changed. Now this is a horizontal diagram is mostly used. So you can set the anodic polarization, then this cathodic polarization. So uh, starting from the cathode side, it comes to the y axis, then again it goes. So we can see that the both the side, cathodic and anode side, we can see that it is gradually increasing. Maybe the here it is gradually decreasing and it is gradually increasing on an identical side. And uh, the Teifel, if you want to apply, there should be some region, uh, linear region. If it is continuously rounding and all, you cannot use it. So if you extend that uh, straight region, 
by a straight line and if the intersecting point will be E core and the corresponding current will be the corrosion current, corrosion potential and current. So, so this way, uh, that is the method by which if we, uh, we compute the value of or determine the value of corrosion current and corrosion potential. Now, these are the other situation where uh, the reaction is, uh, uh, the cathode and anode reactions are not activation controlled. We can see the first one, that this is, this is the method now, nowadays, you know, usually all uh, softwares are coming like this. And now this is the plotting technique, you know, x axis, y axis configuration, you know, normally used. Now, in this one, you can see that the anode side, the first A diagram, the anode side, the cathode side is left, it is activation controlled, but the other side is almost passivated. The second one, B also we can say that it is almost concentration limited cathode, the other side is activation controlled. Here it is again, the, uh, this one is almost concentration limited, other one is passivated. So this type of uh, uh, diagrams also if we get, people including myself of course, we are going for extrapolating and finding out the E value and I core value. Accuracy of course, maybe I do not know uh, how far accurate it will be. Now coming to the localized corrosion, this will be the, the, the terminology. Now coming to the cathode side, to anode side, we can see that the dissolution, that is the activation is increasing. So dissolution will be there. And for some passivation metals, you know, where there is a passive filling formation, we could see that there will be passive, passive transition. And once comes to the uh, transition is complete, there will be a flat region where there is no, the current remains constant. Then uh, once it is complete, if still higher potential is applied, there will be a Transpassivity where this pitting increases. So this way, this is the usual behavior of a passive metal filling. That means aluminium, etc. It will be behaving like this. Now this is for the pitting corrosion cyclic, uh, no, potential dynamic polarization techniques for finding out pitting corrosion locally. So in this case, again as usual, this will be activation control behavior and all will be there. But here our aim is not to find out what is the corrosion current and corrosion potential. Of course, by uh, you know extrapolating. Uh, here and here, you may get a corresponding voltage and current, so there is no doubt. But our intention is not that whether the specimen or the material is having pitting tendency or not. So in order to identify that, what we have to do is, if we increase the potential beyond maybe 300, you go up to some 1000. And if the curve is flat, passive, there is no possibility, even at a higher potential, there is no potential. That means what is the meaning? Even in a very severe corroding environment, there is no possibility for getting the activation increased. So it is stable, passivation. Now suppose if there after 500 millivolt or 600, if there is an increase in tendency, so what we have to do is that at increase in tendency, just reverse the polarity. So reverse can will be there. In an ideal situation, if there is no pitting tendency, the same way it will come back and trace the curve. light side, IP and the portion of the If there is pitting tendency, there will be a loop formation and it will close again. The size of the loop in fact determines how potentially pitting is there. If the size is very small, the pitting potential is quite less. Of course, if you ask what is the theory behind that, I am a material, I cannot say that. I do not know. Then, of course, if the value is also bigger. That means the loop is forming very nearer to the E core value. That means where E core is marked. Suppose the loop is, that means that the crossing is very nearer to that means there is every possibility that in an operating environment itself, no need of, no need of any severe environment, pitting can happen. If it is much to the right, that means only in a severe environment, pitting will be happening. So, you, one cannot find out what is the pitting current exactly. Only you can, one can say that what is the limit of pitting current, the lower limit and higher limit and pitting potential. But there are even some papers, you know, they have mentioned pitting current, one particular value of pitting current. I do not know. And recently we are, we are discussing again a paper. Uh, some papers, you know, they have only simply done only uh, table polarization and they have discussed uh, as if they have done uh, cyclic polarization. Then finally, my friend, you know, he, uh, you know, we were editing a paper. So I got struck with that. Then I sent a mail to them. Initially, he had not replied. Then I, I just warned him because if you are not giving the reply, I will write to the, uh, is what is happening because is it my ignorance or your theory problem? So finally, he gave me a reply. It is a mistake. And he told that I have taken it from some other author. Then I have gone to that paper. That paper also written like that. So a series of paper which has written like that. Same mistake. So pitting corrosion 
cannot find out a single value of corrosion, pitting, corrosion current. Only you can find what is the range of the pitting potential and pitting current. Now, once if you have the, uh, you know, no, no, the corrosion value by extrapolation, how to find out the corrosion? Because according to Faraday's law, Q is equal to NF into W divided by M. These are very, uh, what is called famous relations. And some, so if you substitute for Q is equal to I into time and W by N that is uh, equivalent weight, then we can find out the corrosion rate because in our softwares now these are all will, uh, will be programmed. We need not to only we have to give the equivalent weight, then it will give the output. Now, uh, linear polarization method, of course, I have not used it. The theory is that the slope of the, uh, the these, you know, these uh, anodic and cathodic uh, polarization curve near the equal value, if you take that will be uh, called the polarization resistance. That is, Rp is equal to let i built i nearer to the I core, e core value, e corrosion value. So, for reaction under activation control, the polarization resistance can be related to the corrosion current by I core is equal to B by Rp. So, these are all, in fact, uh, the where B is equal to B, uh, B C, beta C divided by 2, 4, 3, 2, beta A plus A, where beta C and beta C are type of constant, will be obtained for the anodic and current slope. That is the slope of the anodic side and cathodic side. So, in this way, we can find out, and uh, uh, that is another method for finding out the uh, uh, corrosion. Now, we will, I will, uh, you know, present a case that I have done in my work. So, the major alloying man in my work is, uh, you know, aluminum uh, is of course as per 5052 because again I was searching for some other alloy uh, which is having application in automotive correctly, but uh, since I did not get it, I was forced to go for 5052. Then of course, even uh, getting a HSLS steel, I was struggled a lot because again, uh, uh, maybe uh, from ICF integral coach factory, they are using some weathering steel. So, that particular steel finally I got it. So, I have used and we know that. Uh, in aluminum alloy, aluminum is the major alloying element and the steel of course iron and for the electronegative 1.6 volt in the galvanic series and iron it is 0 point, minus 0 0.44. So, naturally when they form coupled, there will be a galvanic cell formation and there will be a current flow. The less noble or the active member of the couple experiences accelerator corrosion while the more noble or less active member will be getting. So, 5052, either under Merna Samet, 50 will be getting corroded and aluminum steel will be getting protected. But Individually, 5052 is much better when compared to steel as per corrosion is concerned. Now, I have used a Teffel extrapolation method. Uh, the tests were carried out on an electrochemical polarization corrosion measurement setup uh, shown in the figure on page. And uh, in this wise, it is SP150, that is, a, you know, that is a proprietary software by ECAP, some uh, biologic scientific instrument. And the specimen for the corrosion tests were prepared from joint festival at three different tool rotation speeds. That means I've, what I have done is, the worst joint on either side and the good joint have selected. And this is the setup uh, uh, of that uh, particular uh, measurement. Uh, now, this specimen I have used uh, were uh, 15 mm into uh, 10 mm into 3 mm, and all this is specimen. Six sides of the specimen were polished using 150 mm paper. Then, copper connector were post pasted at the center of the surface opposite to the surface such that the conductor contact approximately equally on steel and aluminum using high conductive silver paste. And after ensuring perfect electrical contact, the copper connector of the cement assembly called mounted in epoxy resin. And the osposed surface, that is the dust surface, is then polished using emery proof sequentially up to 1000 degrees. So, highly polished surface. Then, I have used the 3.5 percent artificial NaCl solution. Electrolyte and deaerated permit to the test by bubbling low pressure nitrogen gas for about uh, 30 minutes. Most of the cases people won't do all these things because these are required if you want to get at least some good result. And before starting the polarization scan, the specimen conductic ligand, we have applied some thousand millivolt for polarizing it and uh, we detach the connection and wait for five minutes to get to stabilize. Uh, five minutes you have polarized, then we have allowed some 30 minutes to get it stabilized after disconnection. Then potential dynamics polarization measurement carried out from 1000 millivolt to minus 200. That means approximately from uh, either side of the uh, what is called uh, E core value at a scan rate of 0 0.15 mi millivolt per second. This can be minimum, but only thing is that the time will be more. In this case, even you are taken around three hours per each specimen. So if we reduce this uh, particular step scan rate, we will get better result, but the time will be still higher. So, and each case we have gone for at least uh, five tests and when you get three nearest value because no tests were given same values repeatedly. So, approximately near three if you get we stop the scan. So, minimum we were forced to do some five tests per specimen. In some cases we have gone for seven tests. 
and maybe uh, months together we have tested it. So these are the result as for the base metals, aluminum, uh, the first one, A, we could see that it is activation control both side and we could see that there is some, you know, sudden increase in the current on the right side with the arrow. This is a tendency for pitting, but soon it becomes stabilized, but it is not much, there is no such fast increase. If it is increasing further, we would have reversed it and seen what is the pitting. But again, the specimen after, the, you know, after test, you could see that A, the bottom, there is minor pitting. So, uh, 5052, there is a minor amount of pitting as per the, and the corrosion rate is very less, 0 0.0331 mm PY, and the current also you can see that 3.05 milliampere, microampere per centimeter square. And the right side, it is HSLA steel, IRSM 4293. Uh, we could see that it is approximately activation control on both sides, and the current is, uh, act corrosion current is 7.1 microampere per centimeter square, and if it is uniform uh, corrosion only we have observed, and it is significantly higher than the value of aluminum. Now coming to joint, uh, these are the three joint, uh, the best joint, uh, the 450, the bad joint and the worst joint on the higher side. So we got for both, uh, for uh, and again you can see that approximately you can say that it is activation control or it is maybe some passivation at the other side. So very strictly speaking, as per uh, the theory of the method, uh, extrapolation cannot be used. But we are assumed that it is approximately activation control on both sides and we have used uh, what is called uh, table extrapolation and we determined uh, the current I core is uh, for the 400, the first one it is 56.23 and for the last one it is uh, 600 that is uh, 47.86 and for the best joint it is 22.91. So this was in fact a beautiful uh, you know, uh, no, observation. Initially we could not understand because uh, the thing is that intermetallics there in all. And for 450 RPM, there is a thin layer throughout. And for 600 RPM, there is very thick intermetallic layer throughout. And for the 4 mm, uh, for 400 RPM, the intermetallic is only towards the top. There is no intermetallic towards the bottom. So what could be the reason? So later, uh, we have searched in the, uh, in, the, in the literature and find that uh, this aluminum iron, most of all the aluminum iron intermetallics, in fact, falls in between iron and aluminum in the galvanic series. Not only that, one more observation we could make is that some uh, 1980 paper we could see that the conductivity, the electrical conductivity of iron aluminum uh, intermetallic is uh, maybe as per steel is concerned, it is around 10 percentage and as per aluminum is concerned, it is around 2 percentage that range. So what happens is what we have uh, you know, concluded is that when a very thin intermetallic layer comes in between the joint, it effectively insulates aluminum from steel. So there is no direct formation of galvanic couple between iron and steel. But the problem is that there is galvanic couple formation between the intermetallic layer and aluminum and steel and intermetallic layer. Now what you have seen that further it is observed that the corrosion rate is not only that some couple should be formed, the area exposed to the medium is also important, the area ratio, it is not simply the area. Of course for aluminum there is large uh, surface area is exposed to the corrosive medium. But as per the IMC is concerned, only limited exposure because IMC thickness is only 1 micron or so in the bottom. So the area which is exposed to the corrosive medium is very less. So the, since the area ratio is less, though there is couple formation, aluminum is not corroded much. Of course, between steel and IMC also, since the area ratio is less, IMC is not corroded much. So the overall corrosion due to galvanic couple is quite less as for uh, the best joint is concerned. Now coming to the bad joint at 400 RPM, that means low strength joint at 400 RPM, as already mentioned, the intermetallic formation is only partial. Now when the intermetallic formation is partial, naturally it is direct contact, electrical contact is there. So galvanic couple will be formed between steel and aluminum. So naturally the galvanic corrosion will be predominant since the area ratio is almost equal because we have placed it such that on either side equal areas are coming. Now coming to the low strength joint at the other side, 600 RPM, what happens is that here the thickness is more than uh, you know, towards the top because we have taken a piece from the top, towards the top the thickness is around uh, 7 to 8 microns. So there is sufficient thickness, not around 1 micron. So the area ratio is increased. So there is increased corrosion both for intermetallic as well as for the 
as well as for the aluminum side. So it is more than the 400 RPM case, but less than the 450 RPM, and more than both uh, what is called the 450 RPM case and less than the 400 RPM case. So these are the surface after this first one is the high that is lost strength the 400 RPM. It is significantly corroded aluminum side. You could see that there is significant corrosion after corrosion is the second one is almost uh, not corroded. The first one is only uh, marginal corrosion and third one is in, it is there but corrosion is there but it is not that high. So in between. So, so this is observation again strength is concerned I told you high strength low corrosion that is conducive low strength you join we got uh, increased to corrosion. So, it is no problem for all uh, good strength join we are getting low corrosion that is a conducive uh, result and the reason is also amplifier and this is for the same uh, for the different uh, welding speed a similar result we have obtained but again in this case we have uh, observed some active passive transition and transpassivity but uh, since it is uh, much higher because the core, e core is value is here between 0.8 and 0.7 and that value is much away from the uh, e core value but there is no since the, you know it is much away from the e core value there is no practical possibility for such corrosion to occur so that transpassivity and metastable pitting we need not worry so again, uh, the same pattern of result we, obt we have obtained. This is uh, uh, the result. Again, uh, for the best strength joint, uh, the corrosion rates are significantly less. So for all the joint, the corrosion rate is more than both the base metal. That is okay. That is one thing. For all the joints, you know, effectively joint, when compared to both the base metal, the corrosion rates were more. But for the high strength joint, the corrosion rate is relatively less. And for high strength joint, the thin IMC layer with about 1 micron thickness exists throughout the interface. And for aluminum IMCs, it comes in between. Aluminum and the steel sheet and the galvanic series will be uh, in between the uh, uh, aluminum alloy and uh, iron. The electric resistance of iron, aluminum IAC will be about 22 percent of aluminum and about 10 percent I already mentioned. This when IMC layer exists throughout the joint interface, carbon couplets will be formed between aluminum IMC and IMC and FE. So this is my observation. So by this uh, uh, I come to an end of this session. So if you have uh, uh, some doubt or uh, some point to raise, we welcome. So no doubt, so we'll stop. So again, once again, I thank uh, uh, Professor Ramesh and uh, the Department of Mechanical Engineering for inviting me for this uh, short time course and giving me an opportunity to interact with a very august audience. And I am double happy uh, in the fact that uh, I could uh, make this presentation in front of my uh, beloved uh, guru, Dr. N. Murugan. And uh, we, um, uh, Sadish Vasu sir, and uh, I am, and again, uh, last day, Venkata Krishna Dr. Anilish, we are all from the same alma mater. So we could, uh, in fact, a person like me could uh, get an opportunity to share this platform that is too big. So I thank once again the coordinators uh, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ramachandran, for sharing your research experience in the field of uh, joining <coughs> dissimilar metals with aluminum alloys and uh, steels. Thank you very much for sharing your experience, sir. As a token of appreciation, we would like to felicitate Dr. Ramachandran with a memento. So I kindly invite Dr. Ganesan to felicitate Dr. Ramachandran with a memento.